All right, so we're going to treat the upper neck here. Uh, the, uh, C1, C2 instability, or better known as atlantoaxial instability, is an instability of too much rotation between C1 and C2. So the skull sits on C1, C1 sits on C2, and we've recreated the muscles that stabilize rotation between C1 and C2, which are the, the main one is the obliquus capitis inferior on both sides. There's one on the right, one on the left. And in order to treat the right one, we want to rotate the head to the left so that it pretenses it. It actually stays out here, but it pretenses it. And we're going to be pressing that muscle along the ridge of C1 here and holding the muscle to get basically ischemic compression and to do trigger point treatment, basically acupressure on this thing, uh, more correctly named nimoreceptor tonus, to get basically the tone of the muscle on each of these trigger points that we treat to reset itself. And then treating the left side, we would want to rotate to the right exposing this muscle out to the surface and again pressing it up against C1 like that at several trigger points to release the trigger points there and reset the muscle and reset the tone of that muscle so that it can better sense and control the instability between C1 and C2, thereby having less irritation of the brainstem in here which when you offset C1 and C2 too much inside will actually create what's called stenosis or a narrowing between where C1 and C2 connect because there's this opening at C1 and there's an opening at C2. And when those openings offset too much, when the ligaments inside are damaged, these muscles have to try to coordinate that so that it doesn't offset too much and doesn't compress the brainstem. And so we're gonna basically do that on the patient today. And so the goal is to take the head and rotate it. The other thing, if I back up for a second here with this model, in neutral, any pressure back here will actually create motion. So you'll have motion like that inside. So by rotating and pre-tensing someone in this position, when I press up against here, there's no shear. So this is considered shear. This is considered shear movement. So if I press here, it's gonna shear forward. But if I rotate and predispose that rotation and press up against here, there is no shear that happens. The bones are interlocked. Whereas in neutral, you do actually have that shear. So this sliding, that sliding motion, I'm exaggerating it right now, but that happens to a smaller level, whereby keeping someone in neutral and pressing up against that isn't actually the best for treating this because you will actually irritate the neurology inside subtly and they might not have pain during the treatment, but they might have dizziness, lightheadedness, or some collection of neurological symptoms after the treatment because of that compression. So like I said, in order to avoid that, we want to rotate their head away about 45 degrees, tuck their chin a little bit. He's already done this before, so he knows exactly what he's doing. Back of the mastoid, which is right here. That's the back of the mastoid on the skull. If you traverse about an inch internally, and right about there is where you're going to be on the obliquus capitis inferior along C1 there. So here's his mastoid. If I go about an inch that way, and I press basically in like that, and I'll always reinforce my index with my middle finger. And so then the key question here is if this causes a trigger point referral into the head anywhere or into the temple or in behind the eyes. And generally the answer is yes and you can feel the tension. And basically I will hold this for 20 seconds minimum. And after I've held it for 20 seconds minimum, if I fast forward, I'm going to reposition and maybe go about an eighth of an inch or a quarter of an inch further down the back of C1 and press on another spot to see if that creates also a trigger point referral from that obliquus capitis inferior into the head. And then again, holding it for 20, 20 seconds. And then I'll probably reposition one more time, again, doing the same thing. And I'm pressing quite firmly, and I'm just basically looking for a referral, and I've done this enough that I know that it's referring into the patient's head, but otherwise asking for feedback, whether or not they're feeling a referral into their head is also useful. And then I would repeat the exact same thing on the other side. Again, tilting them this way, rotating them a little bit, exposing that posterior part of C1, and then pressing. And again, I will repeat that roughly on three spots. Again, holding each spot for 20 seconds. Might be doing a little bit quicker than 20 seconds here. If 
for the purposes of this demonstration, but in a normal setting, I would do it for longer. And I only have one more spot. <laughs> Sometimes you'll get a natural reaction. The alternative to doing this with my index finger, and I'll show this in a moment here on the opposite side, it's the alternative that I will often utilize more so than what I just did is I'll wrap my hand around, I'll be able to grip, grip the entirety of the neck while I press with my thumb on those same spots. And then I can literally let go of my left hand. And again, so there's the mastoid. So I'd go in about there and it's simply this pressure. And all I'm doing is gripping my thumb in like that. I'm not really using my whole arm and I have my forearm resting on the headpiece. So really all I'm doing is, is doing this motion with my thumb and holding that, which I can do with quite a bit of resilience for quite a long period of time. So that's the alternative to doing it with the fingers. And then again, I would reposition. Again, I can do this all with one hand because I'm slightly pulling with my fingers while I'm using my thumb, but I often like to just gently grab the head and hold it there so that the patient can passively keep their head in that position so they're not actively trying to resist me potentially. So these are rotational stabilizers because it's a rotatory or a rotary instability. The second rotary stabilizers that are important of importance that I find also originate or that the obliquus capitis doesn't originate on the mastoid but the SCM does originate on the mastoid and it goes down towards the collarbone and these ones are much more easily instead of pressed up against the spine they're much more easily squeezed upon themselves and with this the goal is to rotate slightly towards the side I'm working on and slightly tilt towards the side I'm working on otherwise that job muscle's job is to turn the head the other way so if I turn the head the other way it's hard for me to grab it because it's engaged. When I have it turned to the side of pressure, the muscles relax so I can literally get in there and pull and gently squeeze and I'm just squeezing it upon itself like that. And then again, pressing for 20 seconds. Starting about midway and then one more and then one more right under the ear. So again, three spots, 20 seconds each. And I gently hold the patient's head here so they feel secure so they don't feel like they need to lift their head off the table and then I'll go just up like I said about an eighth of an inch quarter of an inch above that press on another spot and these will often refer into the temple into the forehead or up on top of the head knowing that these are trigger points that are relevant to the patient's symptoms and again resetting this muscle the SCM on both sides and the obliquus capitis inferior on both sides will temporarily aid in a much better rotational stabilization of C1 and C2 until the, the muscles get overworked and fatigued again, in which case they'll build up trigger points and the patient will generally become symptomatic again. And then one last one up here. And the higher you get, the more relevant the symptom referral will be because the higher you get, the more close it is to the C1 and C2 that it's trying to stabilize rotationally. And then I would repeat the exact same thing on the other side with the left SCM. And that's the most important part of doing nimoreceptor tonus treatment for atlantoaxial instability patients. There often is some jaw involvement and uh, so it would work on the temples, potentially the masseters and the pterygoids. Um, and that's usually about it. So I'm gonna now do the other side. And turning a little bit towards that side, getting one spot about midway. And 20 seconds worth. And then go up again about an eighth of an inch, quarter of an inch. Another grab. And so by performing this subsequent release of trigger points uh, without actually doing stereotypical stretching by releasing trigger points along the path of a muscle or along the path of, path of muscle fibers you will by default elongate that muscle so basically equating to what would be deemed stretch without actually having pulled a away from b in the normal stretch fashion that we're, we've all become used to so you actually accomplish stretch or elongation 
without actually pulling the origin away from the insertion or the insertion away from the origin, attempting to basically just stretch fibers, we're releasing trigger points. And when you sequentially do multiple trigger point releases, you by default lengthen that muscle, which again equates to what would be deemed stretch. So the muscles then become more resilient, more responsive, and better able to do whatever it is they're trying to do. In this case, with C1, C2 instability, they're trying to stabilize C1 and C2, and they have done a better job of this after this type of treatment.